Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever been really thirsty? A lot of times we say, you know, I'm dying of thirst, and we kind of exaggerate, but, you know, occasionally there's been times in our lives where maybe you've been so thirsty you couldn't stand it. I remember when I was in high school and I used to do some hiking. Our church's youth group would go to the High Sierras once a year, and in order to go on that trip, the pastor made sure that you were ready for, you know, a week of backpacking in the High Sierras. So you had to make it to the top of Mount Baldy first. So we would go up to uh, the beginning of that trail, and because Mount Baldy doesn't have a whole lot of places for water, sometimes there are some streams, but they're not advisable to be drinking out of. But in the summer, it could be very dry, so you have to carry all your water with you, and it's over 10,000 feet. So it's a, a long track up there, and I remember the first time I went thinking, you know, oh, I, I want to go on this uh, backpack trip, so I need to make it to the top. And I had some water with me, but I didn't want to bring too much because it's pretty heavy. But it was an all-day trip. And it was in the blazing sun. And as you get higher, there's you know, no trees above the tree line. There's no shade. There is no water to be found. I had found that I had drunk almost all my water, and I hadn't even made it halfway up yet. And I was getting kind of worried. I thought, man, what am I going to do? Now, of course, I was never in any danger because there was other people on the trip who were more prepared than me and brought extra water, but still, you know, you're not going to ask people for their water because they planned on it, and so I tried not to, to worry, but as I got to the top and it was afternoon and we had to make it all the way down, and on that trip down, my tongue was like a piece of cotton. I couldn't believe how thirsty I was. I thought I was going to die. Of course, you know, maybe I was a teenager and I was just exaggerating, but certainly that thirst was memorable. That desire for some taste of cold water on that hot trip up and down Mount Baldy was something that I'll never forget. And so I think that for a lot of us, we don't recognize the impact of what Jesus is saying in our text today from John's Gospel, where he talks about whoever thirsts, I will give them living water. And so, you know, in a day and an age where we can just turn on a tap, and if you uh, want water that tastes a little bit better, you can get a filter. You can put it in the refrigerator and have ice cold water. There's bottled water everywhere. People are always uh, have ex access to good drinking water. But that's here. That's in our country. That's in this day and age. In Jesus' day, fresh water was rare. You had to make sure that you were near a well. You couldn't guarantee that the water anywhere else would be safe and even in the world today there's people who drink out of the worst kind of water holes that you can imagine places in africa and india where drinking water is hard to come by and so we don't recognize sometimes because in a way we've been spoiled we've had so many blessings by living in a, a country that has access to that type of clean drinking water. So we don't think about the importance of fresh water. We don't realize that we need it a couple days without water and you'll be dead. And so we have really taken it for granted. But Jesus lived in a time where that was a real need. And people knew when he said, if you are looking for fresh water, living water. It's not just a luxury. It's something that is a necessity for life. And so he's pointing the people to the real place for that thirst-quenching water. It's himself and the gift of his spirit that in essence is the thing that inundates our soul and submerges us with <clears throat> that satisfaction. It's no wonder that baptism is connected with the gift of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 3 because it is in the waters of baptism that the Holy Spirit truly does inundate and submerge us in the gifts of God. God doesn't hold back. When he gives the gift of his spirit, it is the cup that is overflowing, as it says in, in uh, Psalm 23. God doesn't just give us enough to get by. 
He'll give us more than we need. And so we can always look to what God is offering us and be thankful for what he gives us. Now, it's interesting, if you do a study on the word water, where does the word even come from? The, actually, in English, the word water comes from an Arabic word that means luster or splendor. And it's a word that is often used in its original uh, context to describe not only water, but we think about jewelry that has a luster. The clear quality of diamonds is something that is very desirable because it really mimics what fresh, clean water is. It's life. It's a blessing. And so in, a, in jewelry, the luster and the splendor of clear jewels like diamonds is something that really comes from that whole idea of what the original meaning for water was. And so as Jesus tells us that he came to give us living water, we see that that word can mean some different things. You know, I mean, water isn't really living, but the idea is that it's running, that it is fresh. Water that is just sitting somewhere doesn't give us what we need. In fact, you know, it becomes stagnant. And we don't want that. We want what Jesus has to offer. And so in this idea of running water, which is pure and running, we see uh, the pure and moving, that is, those two themes are found in what God gives us in his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is moving. He doesn't just stay in one place. He moves people's hearts. He moves you from sin and temptation to desire God's will and to want to do what's right. It's pure. It's something that brings about a cleansing of your heart. It is through the forgiveness of your sins and what Jesus did on the cross that you're acceptable to the Lord and the Holy Spirit applies that to your life. So just as running water is moving and pure, so the Holy Spirit is moving us in the right direction, purifying us. And so this is more than just a symbol. If it were just a symbol, then maybe we could just say, oh, it was a nice idea that Jesus talked about. But instead, it's something more than that. Because Jesus truly is necessary for life. Jesus is the one who, if we ask, what does it mean to be thirsty? What we're really considering is, what is life like without Jesus? What is life like without Jesus? The world thirsts for what Jesus has to offer, but unfortunately not everybody is ready and willing to receive what Jesus is offering. They're still thirsty. They're still desiring hope and life and meaning, and yet they don't have it. Now, my sermon title, Living with an Unquenchable Thirst, is kind of contradictory to Jesus' idea when he says, whoever thirsts, I will give him something to drink, and it will satisfy them. And even in the Beatitudes, in Matthew 5, Jesus says, whoever thirsts for righteousness will, uh, will be satisfied. So is it really true that we have an unquenchable thirst? I would say that through faith in Jesus, he does quench your thirst. But there's another aspect that is unquenchable because we can never get enough of what Jesus has to offer. We can never say, oh, I've learned enough from the Bible, or I've done enough Christian works and I can just do my own thing now. No, there's an unquenchable aspect of our life in Christ that Jesus talked about when he said at the Last Supper, he says, he's talked about how, do not let there be any law outstanding among you except for the law to love. We should pay all our debts, but there's one debt that can never be paid, one thirst that will never be quenched. It is the thirst to continue to love to love God, to love our neighbors as ourselves, to put people first, to live for them and not just for ourselves. You see, Jesus has put the thirst for these things in all people. There's a passage in uh, Ecclesiastes that really talks about this, and it's Ecclesiastes 3.11, that God has set eternity in the human heart. Well, what does that mean? If God has placed eternity within you and with all people, that means that we were not meant simply for this physical world that is passing away. This world is not all there is. There is an eternity within us, a desire to be in eternity with the God who created us. And so that desire is only satisfied through what God offers. 
as we celebrate Pentecost, we remember Jesus wanted that for the people. In the Old Testament lesson, they got a taste of that. The elders of Israel received the Holy Spirit, but if you notice it, they didn't have it for a continual amount of time. It tells us that some of those elders that were still in the camp, they even received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but they didn't prophesy again. Why not? Because it was just a foretaste of what God would offer when Pentecost came around. And so Pentecost was the outpouring of the Spirit that keeps on giving. But why don't we all have that? I mean, as Christians, the gift of the Holy Spirit is promised in your baptism. In Acts chapter 2, it says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is given to all those who believe. In your baptism, we receive, we receive the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't mean that that is all that God wants for us. Because again, if this water that is bringing life through the gift of the Spirit just sits, if it's just in our life and we don't do anything with it, then it becomes stagnant. Then it can become tainted. Then it doesn't bring life to anyone. You know, a pond that just sits without any outlet, if it's not moving, it gets pond scum. And as I got in the picture there, the pond scum, you know, nobody wants to drink out of that kind of water. And so if you offer to somebody else something from your own life that isn't refreshed through the gift of the Spirit, what are you offering them? Maybe some aphorisms, maybe some temporary hope, maybe something that is just a band-aid to the problems in their life, but it doesn't really satisfy. Why? Because it's human wisdom, it's stagnant, it's death. But through the Holy Spirit, the life-giving waters of Christ's love, the gospel message is something that continues to bring life into the lives of God's people. So think about some of those things that... <clears throat> in our own lives could be that gift, but if we don't move it along and use it, <clears throat> then we aren't benefiting anyone. That could be a, a talent that you have that you use just for yourself, but not for the benefit of another person. How about seeking your own solutions to problems? Like It's like settling for stagnant water. It's cutting ourselves off from the source of God's love through prayer. Now, of course, as Christians, you know, maybe we pray, but a lot of times I think that prayer is something we think about as a second thought or maybe in an emergency, only when we need something. God is the vending machine in heaven. We just come to him when we want something. But for receiving the waters of life, having that being moving in our lives, then the spirit is available to ask God for anything and everything to Remember that even when we don't have the words, as it says in Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit prays with groans that words cannot express. In our Bible study last Thursday, we covered that passage, and it's interesting to, to talk about that. I mean, how is it that God wants us to pray if we don't know what to say? How can we pray if we don't even know what the words are? We have the reassurance that the Holy Spirit knows your heart and that his prayers for you are so much more powerful that we can be satisfied to know that God is for us. And if he is for us, who can be against us? He's praying, the Holy Spirit's praying before the throne of the Father, pleading on the blood of Jesus that our sins, which are forgiven in our baptism, Baptism means that we are children of God and that God will not abandon us and that he'll be with us in all things. So as God has given us this promise, as Jesus is offering this, he invites us to seek that which is fresh and that which is alive. You know, this is something that was promised even in the Old Testament. Uh, I'm sure that maybe Jesus was even thinking of maybe Isaiah 58 verse 11 where, he said, where it says, the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places, and make your bones strong, and you shall be like the watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters never fail. You see, Jesus knows what you need, and he's going to give you the things that are necessary. In a world full of temptations, we need only that which God can offer. That is what refreshes. That's what heals. That is what strengthens us to face the problems of life. 
You know, this is actually the second time in John's Gospel where Jesus is talking about living water. The first time was back in chapter 4, where he was talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. And as he talked to her about how, if you would ask me, I would have given you living water. And she thinks, you know, he's thinking about the physical water in the well. And she says, it's deep. How are you going to even get that water? It's, it's, you don't have anything to draw with. <clears throat> but you see, he was telling her about the kind of water that would be uh, the spirit. And it would be uh, the love of God that is seen in the gospel message. And as she started to recognize what Jesus was really talking about, you can see that Jesus, you know, sure, he offers us things in life that are helpful, but the thing that he promises, the Holy Spirit, doesn't take away the problems of life. It doesn't guarantee freedom from problems. This woman who was at the well, she was an outcast in her society because, you know, it tells us that she had, uh, had slept with several people. She had many husbands in her past, and the man she was living with wasn't her husband. And so Jesus just points that out. And instead of getting mad at him, she knows that there's something about him. He wouldn't have known that, so maybe he's a prophet. And so she goes with that. I can see you're a prophet, she told him. And so he still doesn't condemn her. He just leads her in the path of eternal life and says, you know, this is, uh, this is what God's intention is. And she was like, oh, I know the Messiah's coming. And, she, and he says, the one who's speaking to you is he. Maybe she had a light go off. This is the one we've been waiting for. And so she doesn't take offense at, at his pointing out her sin, but they go to the village and she can't stop sharing with everyone what she has learned, what she has seen in Jesus. Let me tell you about a man who knows everything I ever did. I mean, that's a pretty shocking thing from a woman who was really an outcast. She forgot about the way people treated her. She forgot about how Jesus pointed out her sin. Instead, she said, I'm thirsty. I want this living water. And so just as Jesus says in our text today, he was uh, proclaiming these words during what is called the Feast of Booths. Now today we're celebrating Pentecost. That was the, the spring or the early summer harvest festival. But this, the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths was a fall festival. So in essence, these two festivals were both talking about God's gracious outpouring of his blessings. And so what was Jesus doing? Well, he was at the temple in, in uh, John chapter seven. And he was telling anybody who's thirsty can come to me. What was probably happening at the temple at this exact time was a practice that the Jewish people had done for hundreds and hundreds of years. Since the building of the temple under Solomon, they used to take gold vessels and go down to the pool of Siloam, which was the lowest point in the city of Jerusalem, and fill it up with water. And then walk up the steps of the temple to the highest point, and they would pour the water out in front of the altar and let it run down. Because that was a symbol of what God had promised. It says in Ezekiel that God will bring about a spring of living water. They'll come from the altar and it'll flow to the east. Where will that go? What's east of Jerusalem? The Dead Sea. It's dead. There's nothing living there. It's stagnant. But if water were to flow into that eastern, eastern valley, then the Dead Sea would become a, a living water, body of water again. You see, the world is like that Dead Sea. We're all dead in sin, but the Holy Spirit brings about this gift of the water flowing from Jesus. The altar was the symbol of God's presence in the midst of his people, but Jesus was truly God's presence in the midst of his people. Jesus came to proclaim who God truly was, that he is the God of the living, not the dead. What that means for you and for me is that if you believe in Jesus, even though we will die physically, Yet you shall live, because God is the God of the living, not of the dead. That living water brings life spiritually and physically. God will bring about the resurrection of his people. And so we have all these promises. And if we have these, this is something we should never keep to ourselves. This is something we should be sharing with everyone. That's why our evangelism, faith-sharing times in church is truly a part of our worship because we need to be reminded of how important it is to share that living water. That living water also doesn't have a long shelf life. I don't know how long water it lasts if you bottle it and keep it inside the supermarket. I mean, they actually do have a little date of expiration, but I'm pretty sure it's still good after that date. But think about it like this, that living water doesn't have a lot of shelf life because it needs to be received by each generation. 
We can't say, well, I've had the living water, so my children are good. No, they need their own source, and they need to find it from Christ. Each generation needs to drink from the living water of Christ and his love, the gospel message of salvation, because it will never uh, satisfy a generation simply because we know about it. We need to pass it on. We need to bring that new generation to know and to taste of the waters of life, to receive what God offers each group of people because it is the reason why we're still here. The reason why Jesus hasn't returned, the reason why you are still alive, the reason why you still have the blessings in your life because God is using you to bring about the life-giving waters of the Spirit to those who need it. So who is it that needs to hear about God's love? Who is it in your family or friends or even strangers who need to hear what God has to offer? But pastor, I don't know what to say. A pastor, I don't have the words. I'm not trained like you. Well, it doesn't say in Scripture that uh, we should go and make disciples of all nations only if you're ordained or if you're a pastor or have theological education. It says, go all disciples and make more disciples in Matthew 28. You see, that gift of sharing the gospel is a calling for each one of us. And as we share the gospel, we will truly find the satisfaction of what God has given us in this life to do. There's no greater joy than to see a person free from sin, free from fear, free from worry, recognizing that in Jesus Christ there is truly hope. Our world wants to, to tear God down and tear down the church and tear down faith, but God's word will never submit or fall before hell, the gates of hell. It will always stand. I mean, it says in the book of Acts that when Peter and James and John were arrested and they were um, told not to talk about Jesus, well, they said, well, we have to obey God rather than man. Basically, they said, we're not going to stop doing this illegal thing that you're telling us that we have to stop doing. And so one of the Pharisees said, well, if it's of God, we won't be able to stop it anyways, but if it's of man, it'll end. 2,000 years later, Jesus Christ is still being proclaimed. Let's listen to that Pharisee who said that, for he was prophetic in pronouncing that this is of God. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came to take the sins of the world away, came to give you hope and life. You've received that living water. Will you allow it to well up within you? to well up, to be a source of life for others? Hear God's promise and know that this is exactly what God is doing in our lives. We have the gift of the Spirit and we can share it. Let others receive that gift so that they may no longer thirst. But I still believe that we'll always have this unquenchable desire to always serve the Lord. It comes and goes, we live in a sinful world, but depend on the Spirit to give you the words. and Depend on the Spirit to share at the right time with the right people so that in heaven, your crown of glory will be when that person says, I'm here because you shared the water of life. In Jesus' name, amen.